this talk's going to be on respiratory emergencies and any questions throughout just put them in the chat as well I'll be asking you guys a few questions and um, so if you can put them in the chat and your answers in the chat as we go through this I think I need to tell you all that it's based on UK guidelines as well so we'll start off quite simple with a respiratory emergency history so it's very similar to most of the histories, but these are the points that you want to focus on for um, that's specific to rest. So you want to know what's happening, how long the issue has been going on for, pain, you know, Socrates, sight, onset, character, radiation, all of that. And then worse on inspiration is very specific to um, rest, chest pain and yeah, respiratory pain, because if it's worse on inspiration, it's pleuritic pain, most likely any shortness of breath, if it's new, if it's old, cough, if it's dry, if it's productive, if it is productive, is what colour is the sputum? So is it green, clear? Is it normal for them? Has it changed recently? And then hemoptysis as well. So are they coughing up any blood? And if they are, how much is it? Is it just blood? Is it sputum stained with blood? And then as well, another important one to ask is noisy breathing. Have they noticed themselves wheezing at any point? And strider, I mean, if they've got strider, you'll probably be able to tell. Um, can you think, if you just pop your answers in the chat, can you think of anything else specific to respiratory that you want to ask in the history? Um, so we've got a few things popping up in the chat. Um, they want they want to ask if they're a smoker. They want to ask about any medications, the occupation, past medical history, underlying conditions such as asthma, travel, and it, it keeps going. Yeah, yeah, that's so. Yeah, and everyone. Lots and lots of good suggestions. So, yeah, they're great. So I've just. Is that for, there we go. So travel history is very important. Um, past medical history, have they got asthma, have they got CPD, anything to do with their lungs, um, pulmonary fibrosis, stuff like that. Medications as well. So a lot of medications can have rest side effects. So if they take ACE inhibitors, for example, and they've just, just started them, they've got a dry cough, it's an option. Family history and social history as well. So smoker, I think like most of you said. And as well, like where they've worked, there's a thing called bird fancies lungs, so if they are birds, that sort of thing. Just lots of extra questions to ask. So it's not just like focusing on what they've come in with, more about their lifestyle as well. And onto the examination. So I've drawn this little, this little person here at the side, just to remind you on exam to like start, have a method. So mine's hands all the way up the arms to the face, down their neck and down their body. So start off with general inspection, do they look well? Looking at their hands, any clubbing, cyanosis, tremor, tar staining. Does anyone know any causes for a tremor um, to do with rest sort of emergencies or not even emergencies? Um, there's a lot of people saying CO2 retention in the chat, as well as a few for yeah, um, beta agonist use. Yeah, so for beta agonist, it's more of like a gentle tremor like this, and then CO2 retention is more of a flap. But yes, so you get them to hold their hands up and you'll see them go in. Um, I always remember at the arms, at that point, I'm like, I'd like to take a set of obs, so blood pressure and all that sort of thing, so you get like a more recent news. Then go into the face, look at cyanosis, any pallor, down to the neck, any swellings. You want to check their lymph nodes as well in a full rest exam because if you've got a massive pneumonia, they might have large lymph nodes around the neck to sign of infection. And trachea, check that it's central. Chest, look, listen. Feel so auscultation, percussion, expansion, that sort of examination, but especially in a rest exam. So next, we'll go into some red flags. If you can put some respiratory red flags into the chat as well, that'd be great. Uh, 
and um, so we've got a few coming through. We've got hemoptysis, calf pain, silent chest, uh, weight loss, fullness in. Um, Amy, are you still with us? Oh yeah, loads coming through. Um, I think we're having a bit. Yeah, I great. Think a few so, of us are having some trouble hearing you. So maybe if you keep your video off, just so it's using up less bandwidth. Yeah, that's fine. Is that better now? That's way better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I'm reading the chat now. There's loads of answers. So I've just put a few on here. So mopsis, cough longer than three weeks, long smoking history and intentional weight loss, night sweats, fevers, and reduced acts, and then literally all of the other ones you've said, there's so many. Um, so we'll go on to a case now. So he's a 19 year old male, he's very short breath, can't complete full sentences. So it's quite difficult to get a full history, but from what he's said, he's had a bit of a cold for a few days, but he's normally fit and well. I've blacked out the uh, past medical history so that it won't give it away. And medications on Ventolin, Fostair. And when you examine him, you see he's got widespread bilateral wheeze and he's not side-nosed. He's got no angioedema, no urticaria, and his OBS, his rest rate's 32, heart rate's 125, blood pressure's 120 over 80, temperature's 37, and his oxygen sat at 93%. So if you, again, put in the chat what your differentials are. Fab, yeah. And that's the one you're mainly worried about. So there's, when someone's wheezy, you're worried about two main things, um, asthma and anaphylaxis. They're the two big ones, but because he's not got any angioedema, there's no history of um, allergy, you're thinking asthma, especially with his history. And then... Other cases, maybe not necessarily this one, but you're thinking foreign body can cause a wheeze, mainly on one side of the chest because it'll have gone down to one side and PE can do, but very unlikely. So here I've put on the nice, no, the BTS guidelines on judging severity of asthma. So if you put in the chat what severity of asthma you think he's having an asthma exacerbation. His um, obs are in the top right corner, so it's a bit easier to see. Yeah, that's great. Most people are seeing severe. So yeah, I thought I could trick you with the O2 sats of 93%, but yeah, it's less than 92%. If, if they were 91%, those sats, it would go straight to life threatening because you only need one of the category above to be that category. Okay. So in my head, I separate them out. So moderate and severe acute, they're really struggling to breathe, um, but they are managing to compensate for that. And by the time you get to life threatening, things are starting to deteriorate and their body's tired by then. So all of the criteria for this are like exhaustion, hypotension low oxygen saps and just all of those things are where the body's starting to really not be able to compensate for the lack of air entry. So I've got the actual guidelines on the screen, which are a bit difficult to read, but I just wanted to say a few things about asthma because in my head, like first, second year, I was like, oh, asthma is not that bad. Like it can't be that bad really to have an asthma attack. And then reading about it more, um, that three people die every day from an asthma exacerbation, which I think is actually a massive number of people. In, this is in the UK and 5.4 million people in the UK at the moment are actually having treatment for asthma. So it is a, it's a massive um, disease that we have. So yeah, these guidelines are a bit tricky to read, but we'll go on to the next slide. So for the management of an asthma exacerbation, I use the acronym OSPIT. I think other people will have used a slightly ruder version, but this one works. I think it works better. If you put in the chat anything that you think works for the OSPIT and what you'd do for this person having an asthma exacerbation.
Yeah, that's great. So I've seen loads of oxygens, steroids, salbutamol. Yeah, amazing. So I've done a bit of a pre-hospital thing, so that's not in this O's bit, but pre-hospitally, if you come across someone having an asthma exacerbation, I think it's good to know that they're told to have 10 puffs of their reliever inhaler a minute apart. And if that doesn't work, then you need to ring an ambulance. So it's actually quite a, after 10 minutes, if they're not feeling any better, you need to ring an ambulance. And it's a, as well, it gives instructions like sit down, make sure you're, you're as calm as you possibly can be. But then the first one is oxygen. So you want to keep the oxygen saturations at 94 to 98%. And then the S, salbutamol nebulizers are best if you've got a nebulizer available, five milligrams and oxygen driven. Next is prednisolone, 40 to 50 milligrams for five days. Um, that's the P of the OSPIT. And so I saw some people saying that IV hyd hydrocortisone, and I think they did used to recommend that. And they do recommend that for more severe asthma attacks as well. But at this moment, we're only in the first stages of managing the exacerbation. And then hypertropium bromide NEBs as well. They're, they can be quite useful. So 0.5 milligrams, four to six hourly. And then the T is for try anything else. So IV magnesium sulfate has been found to be quite useful, um, but that's a later on sort of part of the management plan and uh, IV aminophilin. So that is, there's not actually that much proof that that works, but if you're getting admitted to ITU, they'll give it anyway, just in case it does help. But that is very end of the line. Critical care would be given that. There wouldn't be any junior doctors giving IV aminophilin, I'm sure. Um, so the bits in yellow I've put because they're like the first first line. So if you they're coming into A&E, being seen by a junior doctor, they're like the first things that we could start as junior doctors. Hypertropium bromide as well, you probably could start, but you'd need to discuss with your senior. And as well, IV magnesium sulfate, you definitely need to discuss with your senior for that. So as well, I've highlighted on the on intubation ventilation. So then on the next page, this is sort of complicated version of that OSPIT. Um, a patient with an asthma exacerbation. So you admit patients with any features of life threatening or near fatal, and you admit patients with any features of severe asthma that persist after treatment and then the peak flow measurement as well. So as well, if you have admitted them, they're feeling better after a few days. Once they're discharged, they need to be reviewed by their GP within 24 hours of discharge, whether that's a phone call or they go in and actually speak to their GP. So that's quite important to know because you, I don't think everyone knows, like once you're discharged from hospital, you still need immediate follow-up. And if you've had a severe asthma attack, they need to be followed up in a clinic by a specialist as well. So that needs to be on their record. So I've put a little bit here about asthma and COPD exacerbation management. So asthma is often more acute than COPD, um, and, but the management is quite similar. So oxygen, you give an asthma and COPD, but you give oxygen and COPD at a different level. Does anyone know what you titrate oxygen and COPD to first? Yeah, yeah, that's great, 88 to 92%. So you aim for that until you can get sort of, and you can find out off their blood gases if you want to do one then, or if they've had an old ABG, you can have a look to see if they're a CO2 retainer. And if they're not, you can titrate them to 98% like you would do, but it's good to check because if you give them too much, they can actually become worse and deteriorate. So you want to be a bit more careful. Um, salbutamol nebs as well for both asthma and COPD. Um, there is saline nebs as an option in COPD because there's not as much proof that salbutamol will work. But I think if they're wheezy with COPD exacerbation, salbutamol will work just fine. And it gives them a good chance of opening their airways a bit. 
with prednisolone, um, asthma, you give a bit of a higher dose for a shorter amount of time. And COPD, you give a lower dose for a longer amount of time. Um, then in asthma and COPD, ipotropium and bromide nerves also, there's no evidence that IV magnesium sulfate will work in COPD. So they don't usually give that. Um, and then you need to decide if it's infective or non-infective. So if their sputum's changed colour, if you've done a chest x-ray and it looks like they've got a, a pneumonia, you'd give antibiotics. Um, in the trust summit at the moment, the first line choices are amoxicillin and doxycycline, but that'll vary from trust to trust. And then COPD, um, intubation and ventilation doesn't work quite as well with them. So non-invasive ventilation sort of is like the first line treatment if they need more, um, more intense oxygen therapy. And then IV theophylline again, similar to IV aminophylline. I'm not sure if there's much proof, but if they're at that point, you might as well try. So on to case two. At two o'clock, a 30-year-old female comes into A&E with left-sided chest pain. It's stabbing, it's sudden onset at 7 a.m., but it's got worse now. It's gone from a four out of 10 to a seven out of 10. And it's worse when, she worse when she takes a big breath in. And she does feel a bit short of breath. She's got a new cough, but she's got no hemoptysis and no sputum. She has a past medical history of nothing. She takes microgynon, but nothing else. Her travel history, she came back from Australia last week. Family history, nothing. She smokes 10 a day and drinks 20 units. And I see you're already smashing it in the, in the chat, so you already know. But is there another question that you'd want to ask quite specific to this history that goes a little bit more in depth? Yeah, calf pain. So now you mention it. Her calf really does hurt and it has done for quite a while. So like you all were saying before, one, you think, yeah, she's got a PE probably. But with her examination, her heart rate's 103, blood pressure is 130 over 89, temperatures 36.7 and oxygen stats are 98. And her left calf is very painful and hot. So differentials, you've already thrown in the PE, well done. Pneumonias, chance, pneumothorax, costochondritis, MI, they're just a list of rest, um, differentials, but yeah, I agree with you, PE. So, what investigations do you want to do for this lady? Okay, yeah, so I see lots of different answers, which I, I like. So with this lady, you do your bloods and in her bloods, you have, some of you have said you want to do a D-dimer. But first of all, is there something you want to do for her, like a score, for example, to work out whether you would do a D-dimer? Yeah, well, score, that's great. So this is her well score because I've decided to do a well score basically because she's got all of the signs and symptoms and you're trying to work out whether to do a D-dimer or go straight to a CTPA pretty much. So her score was 7.5, which turns out if anything over four means it's very likely that she's got a PE and there's no point doing a D-dimer. So it's quite a good score to stop doing all of the unnecessary D-dimers, okay? But they're her blood, so you do FBC, CRP, use and use, LFTs as well to make sure if you do need to anticoagulate, she's got a baseline for LFTs, troponin because she has got chest pain, and you decide to go straight to CTPA. Okay, and maybe do an ABG, but at the moment her SATs are fine, so you probably wouldn't do one. And then chest X-ray and ECG. So, what does this ECG show? So 
it shows sinus tachy, this ECG. Um, now, a lot of places will tell you S1, Q3, T3 is the main thing for a PE, but the actual main ECG finding is sinus tachycardia. So that's what this ECG shows. Um, the textbook says S1, Q3, T3, but sinus tachy is the most likely one. So that's why I put that one in there. Okay, so this is her CTPA. Now, this wouldn't be her CTPA, actually, because this is quite a big PE. Um, it's this whole thing right there, but that's not hers because she would be a lot more unstable. And I gave her um, gave her OBS quite, quite normal, so we would have a bit more time. But yeah, you're saying saddle PE. Yeah, that's a massive PE in that. Um, it's quite handy if you've got a, radio, a radiographer to have a look as well, because a lot of the time the PEs are so small, it'd be too difficult to notice. But yeah, well done. So management of a PE. For this lady, what would you do for her? You've had a CTPA and you found it. How are you treating it? So yeah, great, loads of different answers, which is good again. It's it's a bit different. So if the CTPA can't be carried out immediately, you anticoagulate them as if they've got a PE. If you're pretty sure they've got a PE, you anticoagulate them, okay? And if they become hemodynamically unstable, you need to thrombolize them. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. But this lady's still stable and you're just gonna treat, you know she's got a PE, so you give, Lots of different options, but nice guidelines say treatment dose of Pixaban, 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, and then five milligrams twice a, get, twice a day for maintenance. So that maintenance is dependent on how long you want to keep them on their therapy. A lot of people are saying low molecular weight heparin and um, anoxaparin and stuff like that. That is an option and you have to talk it through the patient. So it's kind of a joint choice. Cho joint choice between you and the patient but nice at the moment I recommend in a pixaban so to decide how long the maintenance therapy lasts you need to decide if it's a provoked or an unprovoked PE so hers would be a provoked PE because you saw she's got a lot of risk factors yeah that's right low molecular weight for um for pregnancy yeah so hers is a provoked PE because she's been on a long haul flight, she she smokes, she takes the combined oral contraceptive pill. Like you have lots of factors that you could alter for her to not get another PE. Okay. Um, if it was unprovoked, unprovoked, you'd want to investigate why she's got a PE because people don't normally just have a random PE. There's normally a reason. So if there's any underlying cancers, if they've got an underlying thrombotic disorder, and that sort of thing. So doesn't low molecular weight heparin have more imminent results? I'm not actually sure about that. I think because she's quite stable, it, she doesn't need the most imminent results at the moment. She is in pain, but she's her SATs are fine. Her blood pressure is fine. So you wouldn't need to rush into the treatment as much. Um, if she had a massive pee, you'd probably want to thrombolize rather than low molecular, low molecular weight heparin as well. For a saddle PE, oh, um, for a saddle PE, yeah, you'd probably want to thrombolize that rather than low molecular hyperin as well because they're probably going to be quite unwell. Um, so for her as well, so you've decided that she's got a provoked D um, PE, so you want to send her to a clinic in three months, and she'd probably be allowed to go off for a Pixaban then. And then you want to give her anticoagulant education and alert cards, so. If she has a head trauma, she needs to know that she'll probably need a CT head because she's more likely to bleed and things like that. So sick day rules and things like that. So with a massive PE, like this other one we were talking about before, a massive PE means hypotension or requiring inotropic support, pulseless or persistent profound bradycardia. So they're very sick, very unwell patients and you want to thrombolize them first line so 50 milligrams of alteplase 
all at once. And then there's other options. So there's thrombus, fragmentation, IVC filters as well. So on to the next case. This is a 60 year old male. He walks into a &E with sudden onset shortness of breath and chest pain it's stabbing and it's worse than inspiration he's got no fevers no hemoptysis but a dry cough that's been going on for six months he's had weight loss and night sweats it's no recent travel his past medical history he's got hypertension nothing else he's on ramipril he's got 50 pack years smoking history drinks 30 units a week his examination is heart rate is 95, respiratory rate is 27, blood pressure 155 over 90, and his SATs at 92%. On general inspection, he does look short of breath. His fingers are clubbed and on examination of the chest. He's got reduced chest expansion, reduced breath sounds, and hyperresonance on the right hand side. So, what do you think this man has? Yeah, amazing. You guys got them all the ideas. So differentials, I've said primary, secondary, attention pneumothorax, probably secondary, pneumonia or PE. What investigations do you do for this man? So I'll take you back to his OBS. What investigations do you want to do? Yeah, so with this man, he's quite stable um, considering it's just the stats that are a bit low. So you would do a chest x-ray in this situation because you're not in you're not in any hurry. You don't think it's attention pneumothorax. But I'll go through the management of attention a bit later. So chest x-ray, ECG bloods, and then this is his chest x-ray. Here you can see where the arrow is pointing. That's his lung and it's completely collapsed. But he doesn't have any like tracheal deviation, no midline shift, so it's not a tension pneumothorax. This shows just a pneumothorax. Um, does anyone know the management of this? Yeah, that's yeah, that's really good. So I never knew whether you did a chest drain or you aspirated or what order you sort of did them in. So this is again the BTS um, guidelines. And now I've tried to highlight the pathway that you'd follow. I'm sorry, it's a bit, it looks a bit funny, but basically this is a secondary pneumothorax because we think he's over 50 years old. He's got a significant smoking history and we think he could have an underlying malignancy from his history. So we think it's secondary. We think there's an underlying cause for this pneumothorax. Um, and it's quite large. We saw on the thing, sorry, it's on the wrong side, but we saw on the other x-ray that it's quite large. So it needs to be a chest drain. Okay. And the other alternative is to aspirate. So if it's a smaller pneumothorax, but they're getting symptoms, you'd aspirate it. Okay. An aspiration. Does anyone know the name of where this yellow cross is on this patient? Like what position, what anatomical position is this? Yeah, that's right. So it's the second intercostal space midclavicular line. Now you can see the cross is above the rib below. It's a bit difficult to explain, but each rib's um, blood supply and nerves are kept below the rib. So just underneath each rib and every rib has one. So when you go in, you want your aim above that third rib because you don't want to damage any of the arteries and the veins and stuff like that. Arteries and nerves, okay? And then this is a 16 to 18 gauge cannula. Just put it in 
pull out the thing and get a whoosh of air and it re relieves that air in the chest, okay? But because this man's quite stable, it's not a tension pneumothorax, you don't need to do that. You can take your time a little bit and you can organize a surgical chest strain. So there's two sorts of chest strain. There's uh, the cell dingers and the surgical, but we'll look at the surgical one because that's the one that's going to be in a &E, the quicker one that it's easier to do. And that, this here, that it, this bit under the armpit is the triangle of safety, okay? So it's bordered by the base of the axilla, the lateral edge of the latissimus dorsi, the fifth intercostal space, and the lateral edge of the pectoralis major. So a lot of people, when I was thinking of this triangle of safety, I was thinking you aim for the fifth intercostal space, but it's actually the center of this triangle that you want to go for. You want to go closer to the axilla because the fifth intercostal space is actually the lowest point of safety. So you want to be careful not to get hit lower than that because that's where you're more at risk of hitting more structures. Um, so yeah, with this man, he'll have a surgical chest strain in A&E. So there's some other sorts of pneumothorax. So what is this a picture of? Does anyone know? Yeah, that's right, attention pneumothorax, well done. So you can see the trachea down the midline is deviated and the, the um, lung, yeah, they're probably hemodynamically unstable, yeah. So you, this is one you'd want to treat straight away, you'd want to aspirate and you wouldn't want this chest x-ray. This isn't a good chest x-ray to have um, because this patient is very unstable and you probably shouldn't have had time to do this. And you can see the lung edge sort of here and there's no lung markings on that left side. Yeah, well done. And then this is a CT. This is really tricky, but does anyone know what this is? Yeah, so pretty much it's the pleural effusion, but if I gave you a history of massive trauma to the chest on that side, a lot of blood loss. Yeah, a hemothorax. You can see on the right-hand side of this chest, there's like a pooling of blood here, which isn't effusion yet, but it also is likely to be, this is a hemothorax. So with this, you'd want to do a chest drain again. Um, and this last picture, does anyone know what this is? If you look closely at the left side, at the apex. Okay, so yeah, this is probably hyper expanded, but if you look really closely on the left hand side of the chest, it's actually a, a small pneumothorax. You can see the outline of one of the of the pleura just I think it's just under the third rib. I don't know if you can see my um I've got a, an arrow. Can you see the edge here? That is actually a bit of a rib. So this is a small pneumothorax. So this is one that you could do more conservative management or sort, of, sort of the waiting for it. And a common presentation of these is the younger sort of asthmatic or um some people with Marfan's are more prone to this. So they get pneumothoraxes more could be um, 
someone with Marfan's or asthmatics are more prone to this. So yeah, well done. How do you differentiate between fluid and blood? So it's kind of it's kind of tricky because blood is fluid on a CT. So you don't really know what that is, but with a history, yeah. So a radiologist would be able to tell, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but with the history as well, if it was a trauma, trauma, it'd be more likely to be blood. And if um, it was just slowly built up and there was more like cardiac history, sort of cardiac failure, then it's probably more likely to be sort of fluid rather than blood. So some MCQs. If you look at this ABG, just pop your answers in the chat what you think it shows. So yeah, it is A and C, but um, sorry, I should have explained the best answer rather than the right answer. So it is respiratory acidosis, but the best answer in this one is type two respiratory failure, because as well as it being respiratory acidosis, they're also got low oxygenation and they're retaining. So the right answer is A, they um, have a low pH, so they're acidotic, they're hypoxic, they are retaining CO2 and and they have a bit of metabolic compensation, that's right. Um, but it's quite small and it's probably it's a chronic change because that takes a few days to kick in anyway. So this is type 2 respiratory failure. What is the correct triangle of safety? Yeah, fab. D, everyone's saying that. So again, it's not really a triangle, which is, is kind of annoying, but yeah, that's right, well done. So what is this diagnosis from this chest X-ray? Yeah, well done. I feel like this year, um, especially in finals, they'll probably throw in a COVID question. So I thought I'd show a little COVID x-ray. Um, but yeah, so the, a lot of the doctors I've seen describe it, it's sort of a fluffy appearance. Um, and I think that's quite a good description. It does just look fluffy all around. So I've compared it to a normal chest x-ray, which is nice and clean and the lung fields are so uh, very um, clear. And this one is just a little bit fluffy. You can't really see a lot and it's worse at the peripheries. So I thought I'd put in a little bit about COVID management at the moment because it changes so much. And it's good to just get a little refresh it on how to manage, although hopefully we won't need it as much anymore, but COVID management currently. So the symptoms are a bit of everything, but the typical ones, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste and sense of smell. A lot of the people I've seen as well had really bad diarrhea and vomiting a few days into feeling unwell. And then a few um, older people that I've met came, actually presented with falls. And then once you do an X-ray, you actually see that they have got COVID. Um, diagnosis on swabs, chest x-ray, blood as well is a bit unusual because with a virus it doesn't usually present like this but COVID shows high neutrophils and low lymphocytes. And then management in where, at the trust I'm at, I'm sure it's different literally everywhere but it depend, it's dependent on the risk. They give oxygen, dexamethasone six milligrams and then antibiotics depending on your risk group. Similar to the COPD um, antibiotics and then I know when I was in a &E before Christmas they were giving remdesivir but someone's told me that they've recently changed to tocilizumab and they're seeing quite good results with that so that's quite an interesting fact and then you have to decide before you admit them into hospital whether they for or not for escalation at that moment and with COVID it's typically non-invasive ventilation first and then you move on to intubation 
how did you how do you differentiate between COVID and pulmonary edema? So pulmonary edema it does look very similar. I've got a slide at the end actually to show you. Um, just so you can see pulmonary edema does look quite similar and I think it's more of the presentation of COVID versus pulmonary edema presentation. Um, remdesivir is an antiviral and tocilizumab is um, a monoclonal antibody I think so one of them targets the, anti -vi the virus and one of them is more the antibodies I think but I'm not sure and google that a bit more if anyone knows let me know. But yeah, sorry, I don't know too much more about that. Another MCQ, what is the textbook finding? So not the typical finding, the textbook finding for PE on ECG. Yeah, fab, um, lots and lots of Cs. So yeah, it's S1, Q3, T3. I like the sinus tacky as well um because it is it is the most typical one but i thought i'd explain the s1 q3 t3 because i find it quite difficult to start with so s1 that actually means the s wave uh, in lead one is bigger hello the s1 the s wave in lead one is actually bigger than it would be normally so it would normally look like the one in lead two and then q3 t3 q3 we means three is bigger than it should be um like it should look like the one in lead two but it actually looks like the, it actually looks like the one in lead three and then the t wave is inverted in lead three so that's what s1 q3 t3 means because i feel like people say it but don't actually explain what that means to you so i hope that helps um so here's some extra reading and then i've here's a little bit on pulmonary edema so you can see the shadows here are more around around the hilum of the lungs. So the pulmonary edema sort of spreads from the middle, but with COVID it's more around the apex, not the apex, the peripheries. And here's just a little bit more about, you can read this in your own time, but it's about the management because it's more specific to cardiac problems. But if you get the um, slides, you can have a read of that. So yeah, any questions? Can you view? Yeah, of course. Uh, the S1, Q3, T3. One, so okay. Thank you, everybody. Oh, also, it'd be really good if you fill in my feedback form because I need it for my portfolio. Thank you. <laughs> I'll post the feedback form again because it's getting lost in the sea of thanks. <laughs> I'll, does anyone, have you seen ECG? Am I all right to stop sharing? All right, I'm going to stop. Bye, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.